I'm sorry. I was just laughing because I just noticed there's tape to the right of me, mm -hmm. and that always makes me wonder what's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just holding it down <laughs> okay. like, on my life. Welcome back to Ohio Has <clears throat> Issues. I'm Stephanie Haney. I'm Mike Polk. And we're happy to have you back here to our first post-primary election mm -hmm. episode. It, for our Priester episode. That's what I'm calling pre-Easter. <laughs> what do you uh -huh, think? I like that. And speaking of, uh, we work at a, uh, a TV station here, and we just had the, uh, the I think the owner, the president or something. The, the most I, important person. The, co the, um, the Commodore of Mally's Chocolates <laughs> was just here and dropped off a bunch of chocolate. Oh. And it's, it, it smells amazing, but this is all that's left. And this mm, is, everybody went through one. this like scavengers as if no one has ever had later. a job. <laughs> Everyone was just grabbing chocolate like they'd never seen food before. And all that's left are these, which look lovely. I'm going to, we'll try one at some point. Uh -huh. But we, the only two eggs that are left are the coffee cream, dark chocolate. Oh, this is coconut royale? Is that With some says? raspberry in it, too. Oh, okay. So what, Just the very adventurous ones remain. But you know how offices work. Um, <laughs> scavengers. That's what we got around here, scavengers. But uh, thanks to the Mallies and uh, happy uh, Easter to all who celebrate. Yeah, happy, happy Priester, happy Easter. Yep, it is Priester. And we've got a great show for you guys tonight. And uh, our coworkers are also scattering them around the background. If they are eating, then they don't want to be seen. They've made that clear to us <laughs> in the background. So it's just the very brave who are behind us now. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but we're going to talk about politics like we usually do on here, Ohio politics specifically. And uh, we got a lot to talk about this week. Yeah, we do. We've got great guests this week. We have our friend of the show, NBC senior political reporter Henry Gomez. He's back. Uh, yes, yes, he is. We also have a voting rights specialist, a legal scholar, Case Western Reserve University School of Law professor Atiba Ellis. He's with us. First time on the show this week. Excited for that. Nice. So this is our pre, this is our first, as you said, after the primary actually just occurred and so this is now we're into the thick of things we're into the real election now yeah so in a little bit we're going to be talking about kind of what happened at the primary kind of like a like a little recap sort of thing mm -hmm. a little what's the word i'm looking for postmortem a little primary postmortem we're going to also talk about if there's been a vibe shift because that's mm -hmm. the thing that happens so often is you have your primary and then oftentimes the candidates uh, in the primary, obviously, you're just trying to appeal to your party. So you might say some things that might be a little bit, a little bit more than you normally would. And now sometimes you got to walk some stuff back mm -hmm. because now you got to appeal to everybody uh, in order to try to win, including those very valuable independents and suburbanites who drive everybody so crazy because we never know how they're going to go. And so I talked uh, with I talked with Henry about this and about how um, the politicians or <clears throat> about the politicians and how they are shifting their tone now that we are actually into the general. Yeah, election. so we're going to get into all of that in a little bit, but we do want to start with some kind of just news of the week because there was a major development related to Ohio politics this week yes. in the first energy House Bill Six bribery scandal world. So. To bring you a little bit back up to speed, former Ohio House Speaker Larry Householder, he's currently serving a federal prison sentence. That's who you're watching right there if you're watching us on the WKYC YouTube page or on your Streaming Plus platform. So if you're listening, you know, click the link in the info and you're going to get yourself it's some just, video of Householder. It's just Larry Householder walking around, <laughs> usually wearing a hat even though he is wearing a suit, which doesn't make any sense. But he does that a lot less, stocking caps. He contains multitudes, and now he also has multiple state felony charges against him. Yes. These Ten are of new. them. These are new, right? Ten of them, yes. Uh, so crimes. Attorney General, General Dave Yost made some comments about that, which we're going to hear in a little bit. But he is alleging that Householder misused campaign money and had ethics violations. And as a reminder, of course, at the center of the House Bill 6 scandal, if you don't recall, that was accepting bribes, convicted of doing this at the federal level to pass a bailout for a First Energy subsidiary. So he says he's appealing the sentence, and here's Dave Yost talking about these new state charges earlier this week. The crimes alleged in this indictment are separate from those that were addressed in the federal trial and stem from different, although related, actions. Even if Mr. Householder's federal appeal is successful, a conviction on state charges in state court for theft in office means the comeback kid will never come back to the General Assembly. Strong words there from Attorney General Dave Yost. And really good lighting. 
Yeah. <laughs> Surprisingly good lighting on Dave Yost. Well done, man. Yeah, you know. If knows nothing how to else, do stream. should be noted that that he is a Republican. This is so this you can't claim exactly a political witch hunt when it's a Republican who is bringing these charges against a Republican, and uh, you know I commend him for his lack of partisanship in that way. So nice work, Dave Yost. Yep, both on the Republican side of the aisle. Now, if convicted on these new charges, here's kind of a key element to all of this. It would ban Larry Householder from running again for state office, which is something that the federal conviction will not do. Interesting. That would not prevent him from running for public office again. Hmm. I didn't know that. That is interesting. So what, do you, what, are, what are the chances? That these things are going to stick, right? Aren't they? We're going to have to see. Obviously, we're going to have to see. We did reach out to his attorney. We do have a statement hmm. from Householder's attorney uh, earlier this week. Stephen Bradley is the attorney's name, and here's what he said. He said, we're just learning about the new indictment, haven't yet spoken to Larry. We hope to do so in the near future, and we'll make decisions how to best proceed. Hmm. All right, so kind of big there. And we will have to wait and see. Just a reminder, much of House Bill 6, some of House Bill 6, uh, that horrible scandal-ridden bill or law is still on the books. We're actually still subsidizing two uh, coal plants, one of which is in not even in the state. It's in Indiana. And that is they true. have not repealed it. Uh, they have not repealed it in its entirety, because they don't think we should throw the baby out with the bathwater. I guess that's what some people have said. Now, first, Governor Mike DeWine was in the camp that said there are some good pieces to this law, but mm -hmm. he did later say no. The entire thing should be thrown out. Has called for its full repeal. Seems seems like that might be wise, but who who am I to say? Pretty corrupt. I mean, he's in, he's serving a 20-year prison <laughs> sentence for federal racketeering. Those that's those are just the facts. Yep. But you're welcome, Indiana. Indiana coal <laughs> mine. Now we want to uh, talk about an article that was published recently by another friend of the show, Andrew Tobias. Mm. He is a political reporter with Plain Dealer, and somebody who was a part of the grand jury for these latest 10 new charges at the state level actually had involvement. Yes, so this is kind of complicated and we'd love it if uh, Andrew could tell us, but we're gonna do our best to summarize it for you. Essentially, these new charges that have been, um, that he has been charged with, Larry Householder, the foreman of the jury, I believe? Yes. Uh, has had past entanglements with well, politics and Larry Householder himself. And in House some Bill cases. 6, he supported. And House Bill 6. He, he supported House Bill 6. So his name is Dave Wondolowski, mm -hmm. and he's the executive president of the Cleveland Building Trades and Construction Council. So, as the four person, one of the responsibilities as being the four person is to sign the indictment. So, his signature is on the indictment. And we do know that he was in support of House Bill 6 before it was passed. Mm -hmm. We don't know what he knew when he was in support of House Bill 6, of course, before it was passed. Um, but we also know that he lobbied publicly for it. And we do know that the Cleveland Building Trains and Construction Council gives money to both Republicans and Democratic candidates. They gave at least $14,000 in campaign contributions to Householder. Hmm. And Householder was then, of course, the Speaker of the House who sort of kind of muscled this through. That was what the money was partially used for, that he got the bribery money, according to that federal conviction. So. We also know this, here's another interesting element to the fact, Public Utility Commission of Ohio former chairperson Sam Randazzo also indicted at both the federal and state level of this. And we do know now that Wondolowski also briefly served on the nominating council for the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio. He was appointed by Governor Mike DeWine to help screen potential FUCO commissioners. Wow, okay. So definitely, definitely some uh, entanglement there. And here's kind of the tricky thing about this. To serve on a jury, to be a four-person on a jury, you're supposed to be unbiased. Mm -hmm. Those are the legal standards. You're supposed to be unbiased. So there's some question as to what may happen here. And just a reminder, um, there are. Can you guess how many? How many? What? What? Is, by population, where does Ohio rank in states? Can you guess? We used to be the sixth city. Okay, that's not a state, though. Oh, the six, I, yeah, right, but I'm just trying to think population But you're actually very close. How that would extrapolate. You're very, so six. We're actually number seven. <laughs> um, but, so very close. But my point is we have almost 12 million people here. You've got to believe that maybe there would have been a better jury foreman than the person who has this many uh, interactions and uh, exchanges connections, right. and connections with the people involved. And so I just, I think that, that I, it would logically make sense maybe to step down, but I don't know legally if it was, he was, 
had to. Or well, it really kind of just depends. That's the thing is grand jury proceedings are secret. So we don't know what happens there. We don't know if he abstained from voting mm -hmm. on the charges that came before. So there's a lot of things we don't know, and we'll kind of just have to see. And some, in fairness, some of these 12 million people are children or <laughs> under 18 and could not serve on a jury anyway. So in maybe like, I don't know, 8 million, I'm just spitballing. Uh, there are 8 million people who would have been better to serve on the jury than him, probably, just logically. Feels, yeah. feels fair. We'll see what happens. I don't know. We'll see what happens. As it stands right now, there are 10 new state charges against Larry Householder. All right. Now, we've been talking to Henry now? Well, not yet. We oh. have an interesting take on this that we need to get to. Oh, yeah. What's the interesting take? <laughs> so, you may or may not be aware of a potential job opportunity, someone you can maybe seek the counsel of should you need oh, it. Oh, right, right. This is great. There's a prison consultant yeah, that's in right. Northeast Ohio. Yeah, explain this because this is this is your guest. This is our guest, one of our guests. One, one quick guest. Uh, we had a call in, so we, you know we didn't have sort of like a formal mm -hmm. interview, but we got a quick little two minute two minute chat over the phone, and so uh, he had an interesting take on this. Bobby Ina is his name, and he is the founder of Prison School LLC. And what this is is it's a consulting firm for people who are going to prison for the first time in their lives. Yes, very unique job that, and something inspired actually by Larry Householder, uh, uniquely enough. We have, <clears throat> you sent me this, just a little bit about uh, what Prison School LLC is. It's the brainchild of Bobby Ina, whose consulting work has put him in the front lines of politics throughout Ohio. In the past decade or so, uh, Ina has watched several politically connected types heading to prison for the first time. And beginning in 2008 with the corruption probe in the Cuyahoga County, more recently the $6 million bribery scheme, that we, the aforementioned one of Ohio House Bill 6 and the bailout of two nuclear plants owned by First Energy. So he had the idea of counseling and preparing people for prison who were, go who were going into this for the first time. Scroll to the bottom there. It's, uh, some <clears throat> of his services that he'll offer is at the bottom. So okay. there, there was something published in the Marshall Project Cleveland newsletter. Oh, thank you. I should have mentioned this. With the Marshall Project. So here's some of the things that can help you cover. Let me just tell people what the oh, Marshall sorry, Project ahead. is really quickly. The Marshall Project is a publication that works on news related to people who are incarcerated, kind of it's, mm -hmm. is an advocacy. They're great. An advocacy organization. Marshall Project is great. Because a lot of people, you know, once they're in prison, Prison, their stories don't get told. So they kind of work on advocacy for people who are in prison. So that's where this came from, this information about Prison School LLC. Here's some of the things that uh, Bobby Ina and his crew can help you prepare for. The school's uh, staff of advisors are familiar with hundreds of state and federal prisons and can offer wide-ranging advice on the facility's rules and protocols, including how the commissary works, how to access medical care, how to send and receive mail and money, and what kind of clothing is acceptable for friends and family making in-person visits, stuff like that. Stuff that I probably wouldn't have thought of if I was going to a white collar prison. Yeah, I wouldn't have thought of it either. And he had a very interesting take on what Larry Householder should do in this particular scenario where he's in federal prison and now facing these new state charges. So let's hear from Bobby Ina. Hey, Stephanie, this is Bobby Ina of Prison School and Metropolis Consulting LLC. Um, yeah, with these new charges hitting uh, Larry Householder today on the state level, it's probably best for him to plead guilty to these charges and then go um, and ask the judge to be served concurrently so he doesn't have to leave the federal prison system. Um, however, if he if he doesn't get that and he wants to go to trial and he's found guilty, he'll be leaving the federal prison facility at some point. Um, and then heading over to a state facility. The state facilities are, are much different. Um, in, in my view, they're much more dangerous and um, they're, they're not in better physical shape than the federal prisons are. And no, no prison is in the best of shape, but the state facilities are not where you want to be. That's, that's for sure. Um, but I think the real question is, and I don't, I'm not a, a lawyer and I'm not a legal expert, but I've talked to some legal experts today and people who have knowledge of this, and they don't know if the attorneys are going to have to give back the money. Um, that, that's another aspect of the, this, but they certainly do believe that they, it, it's certainly looking like they will have to give back that money. Um, but we don't know of any legal precedents that this has ever happened before. But when it comes to a jail standpoint, um, it would be within householders' best interest um, to just plead guilty with these, wrap these up, and uh, and serve the sentences concurrently. You know, right now he is in prison for 20 years. It's in federal, so he's got to do 80% of his time. He does good time, drug-free, 
um, maybe gets a part of the CARES Act at a certain age. I think it's um, coming up. Maybe he gets out by the time he's 75. Um, but you certainly don't want to be going out when you're 75 and then going right into a state prison system after that. So we'll see what he does. But in my view, it's the best thing to do is just plead guilty, ask the judge to be concurrent sentences, serve all your time in, in the federal prison system. That's a big ask, asking the judge to make those sentences concurrent. But that's Bobby Ina's take on that. Uh, also, likelihood of Larry Householder taking that advice and pleading guilty, I'm going to go ahead and say slim to none. He seems a little obstinate about things sometimes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, interesting also that there are enough like white-collar criminals that you can run a, you can have a business. He's running a business, and I, it, I believe that it can be successful where you just tell white-collar criminals how to, like, what, if they have to bring a toothbrush to jail. <laughs> that's, that's where we're at, folks. Yep. Woo! <laughs> so if you or someone you know is interested in Prison School LLC, we'd be remiss if we didn't share the phone number to get connected with the Prison School. Prison School, by the way, does sound like a raunchy R-rated 80s comedy, doesn't it? <laughs> does it, it not? It does, it does. I can see the, the VHS cover for it. Mm-hmm, yep. <laughs> it's a cartoon. That number is 216-973-4088. Again, that is 216-973-4088. This is not an advertisement for nope. Prison School. But should you need it, we are providing that information. It's nice. We don't endorse prison school, but, you know, if you need it, it's good to know it's there, I suppose, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, now, uh, I've been jumping the gun because I've just been <laughs> champing at the bit to talk to my friend Henry Gomez because I wanted to ask him about uh, what's going on with Ohio, the Ohio Senate race now that we have our candidates decided. And he brought me up to date, and uh, here he is now. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm joined once again by Henry Gomez. He is an NBC political correspondent. He covers all politics really across the nation, but he does seem to have a concentration here in Ohio. And I think that that has something to do with the fact that he is one of us, one of us. Henry, how are you? I'm doing great, Mike. How are you? Good. Are you ready to educate Ohioans about Ohio politics? I will do my best to educate oh, them. That's all we can ask of you, Henry. So it's been over a week now since the primary, and you were writing this week about some of the changes in tone or shifts in messaging that you might have seen, not just out of the um, Marino camp, but also out of Sherry Brown's camp and two of his adversaries, uh, the two adversaries who he vanquished to take the primary. Um, so why don't you tell us about some of the shifts in, uh, in messaging that you're seeing from the Ohioans in, in, in the Senate race? Yeah, so I think what we learned or found pretty quickly was why the Democrats wanted Bernie Marino to win that primary. They spent a lot of money in the last week, I think more than $3 million on ads that established Bernie as the, the true conservative in the race, which why would Democrats put that ad up during a primary uh, unless the goal wasn't to tell all those Republican voters that, you know, he's one of them. And it worked. I mean, it, it worked as long with a combination of other things that helped get Marino over the finish line, and not just over the finish line, but he won pretty decisively. So what we saw immediately from, from Sherrod Brown's campaign was this, this contrast. You know, here you've got this former car dealer who had, you know, faced some lawsuits and some other legal issues in his career and business versus a guy like Sherrod Brown, who's, you know, been in politics all his life, but he's carved out this identity as, you know, working class hero. Sherrod Brown's big mantra is respecting the dignity of work. So they clearly saw the opportunity to contrast Sherrod with a businessman, a, a car dealer, no less. Uh, we heard terms like sleazy car salesmen in the Democratic messaging after Marino's win. The Ohio Democratic Party put up a website like Bernie is a lemon dot com. I don't know if that's the exact URL, but, you know, basically again, poking fun at Bernie for having been a car salesman. That does sound pretty from... standard Ohio DNC lame as far as a joke <laughs> goes. Or, uh, so that I'd totally buy that. Do you happen to know if if, uh, if he, Sherry Brown or his campaign actually had anything to do or any say in the promoting Moreno as uh, the uh, as it, who he hoped would be the his opponent? No, I mean, I'm told the answer to that is no. I mean, these, the way these super PACs get set up, they're not really supposed to, they're not right. allowed, they're legally not allowed to coordinate with the campaigns themselves. So this was a super PAC that's aligned with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. They play in a lot of Senate races so that, you know, 
I mean, the, Ohio could very well determine which party is in control of the Senate after the November elections. You know, Sherrod Brown's seat could be the seat that decides it. And so Schumer, who wants to continue being Senate Majority Leader, you know, has this group that on his right. behalf targets races to spend money in. And they've, you know, Democrats have had this strategy over the last few years where they'll try to elevate who they think is the candidate they can beat the, e the beat most easily. And they'll spend money on ads or messaging that elevates that candidate. And they, we saw it again here uh, in Ohio. Can you think of any examples where, I know that it's been the strategy for, in some cases, can you think of any examples where that's backfired? Because some people are obviously criticizing that strategy and saying that it's sort of, you know, you're playing with fire there or uh, some of uh, being in some way shady by going about it that way. Have there been examples where it's been unsuccessful? I'm trying to think of like one like potent example of it backfiring, but the, the reality is the, the, the examples that I can think of are areas where it's, it's actually worked. I mean, the, 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 the gold star example of this comes back, I think, in back, you know, over 10, back in 2012, it was uh, Missouri, Claire McCaskill was running against a guy named, well, she wanted to run against a guy named Todd Aiken, who, you know, they viewed as being the candidate that they could beat. Easiest. I believe, I believe the and, term was legitimate rape. What, quote, legitimate that rape. Was the, that was the quote that ended up undoing him. But mm -hmm. in the meantime, McCaskill and her allies ran these ads that were promoting Aiken as like the true conservative. It got him through mm -hmm. a competitive primary. And then, you know, when it really mattered, that legitimate rape comment comes out, uh, Todd Aiken's views on abortion, and it sunk him as a candidate. McCaskill wins what was a really, really was supposed to be a really tough race. It happened again in 2022 in Pennsylvania. Democrats spent money. Uh, the Democratic candidate for governor of Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro, spent money to talk about Doug Mastriano, this Republican election denier who had, you know, really, really, really had some extreme right wing credentials, but, you know, basically ran ads promoting those credentials during the Republican primary because they felt Mastriano would be the easiest candidate. And it, I mean, Shapiro trounced Mastriano uh, very decisively. How are the two candidates since the primary? How have they, uh, have they stepped up their appearances? Where has Marino been? Where has Sherrod Brown been? And what are they saying when they're there? So we are kind of in a quiet time now. We do have, you know, six, uh, six months, or uh, seven months, eight months till the, till the general election. Marino spent some time last week in Washington, D.C. He went to like the Senate Republican luncheon, I think on Thursday. Uh, Senator J.D. Vance was there with him. You know, Vance was a big proponent of Marino's campaign, kind of meet the other Republican senators, the ones who may not have been on board with his campaign during the primary, although a lot of Republican senators were. Sherrod Brown, the interesting thing, and we didn't talk about how Marino's been trying to brand Sherrod Brown, and that's basically as a communist, a far left communist. I mean, he called him a commie in his victory speech last Tuesday night. What does Sherrod Brown do the morning after uh, the Ohio primary? He's on a conference call with a vice president from Intel, the president of the Ohio Chamber of Commerce, who happens to be a former Republican congressman named Steve Stivers. And they're having this feel good kumbaya moment where they're talking about how Sherrod Brown helped land funding to expand the Intel project in Ohio. And it, you know, if, if there's one moment that can, you know, cut directly at the Sherrod Brown's economy argument, it's that. It's, yes, Sherrod Brown is progressive. Yes, Sherrod Brown has a record and reputation for being one of the most liberal senators. But here he is working with, you know, titans of industry, the Chamber of Commerce, not exactly, you know, organizations that you would associate, mm -hmm. you know, with the far left. And they're talking about how he helped them get something done. And I think that's what you'll see more out of out of Sherrod Brown. You know, he did emphasize, of course, during this call that, you know, this was a deal that was good for Ohio workers. There was a representative from uh, a trade union that was also on the call, very much on brand for Sherrod Brown. But, you know, that's, they, that's, that's Sherrod Brown's challenge, is to not let the other side define him uh, as a commie. You saw that happen. Uh, I'm learning about it because of you, and our viewers are learning about it because of you. But will that break through? That's the question. He can do those things all he wants. He can be on those phone calls. But is, is there any indication that the messaging um, for him or Marino is breaking through to people? Not yet. And one thing we saw during the primary was that until the very end, voters weren't paying as much attention. There was a lot of money spent on TV ads. What these, what the consultants running the campaigns were telling me was that there was the ad recall was very low. The reason it was so close at the end 
and so many undecided voters was because the ads that Bernie Moreno was running touting the Trump endorsement hadn't really broken through. They did break through in that last week when Trump came into the rally here and there was more money on TV and people were finally starting to tune in. So I think we're in for another lull here before the general election where, you know, voters are exhausted. They're not going to be paying attention to TV ads. And I don't think we're going to see, I mean, Sherrod Brown is still advertising on TV as of, uh, as of the other day. I'm not sure what he's up on right now. And you'll start seeing Bernie and his allies be on TV more. But that that's that's to your answer to your question, that's what needs to happen for Sherrod Brown's message to get through. He needs to be spending money on TV, promoting himself in the way that he wants to, defining himself, and he'll spend money trying to define Bernie Marino the way that they were seeing like in these, you know, web videos or in press releases. Uh, the way those things make a dent is when you put money behind them in the form of TV advertisements. In one of your recent columns, you talked about how things did get pretty contentious among the Republican primary uh, contestants there at the end, and they said some pretty nasty things. Are they trying to walk that back now and show a more united party? You had the DeWine endorsement uh, for Matt Dolan and Portman. Are, are they all making nice now? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, on one hand, it's not surprising because this happens after every, almost every heated primary. The, the people that were against you, you know, in your own party, come back home and they they rally around you and they all have this language about how the the goal is now to beat Sherrod Brown. It was a little amusing to see how quickly it happened given how nasty it was in the final days. I mean, Mike DeWine held a rally for for Matt Dolan the night before the primary talking about how you know Dolan was the one who would go there and get things done. And he was the only, he was the candidate in the race who had the best chance of beating Sherrod Brown in the fall. And then of course he, he falls in line. The one that was most amusing to me was Ohio Secretary of State, Frank LaRose, who the last month of his campaign was explicitly about how Bernie Marino could not be trusted, how untrustworthy Bernie Marino was. And then the day after the primary issues a statement about how he's with, you know, Bernie Marino a hundred percent and he's the right guy to take, take this fight on. And it's just like, it's very Frank LaRose though. I mean, he yes. was somebody that was a moderate, a centrist, a no labels guy who immediately pivoted to the hard right to make himself out to be an acolyte of Donald Trump to try to win that Senate nomination, he lost. So now he's, you know, basically pivoting again and talking about how great Bernie Marino is. I know it's impossible to see in the future, but you've been around this game long enough. What happens to Frank LaRose now? He's in a kind of unique situation, still an office holder. Uh, now a couple of times lost uh, races for that he was going, that he really wanted, for seats he really wanted. What happens to him and how is he looked upon by Ohioans now? Well, he's so young. I think he's 44 years old. So he's got a lot of time to rehabilitate his image to the extent that it's it's tarnished among you know, certain people. I know that there are a lot of people who supported Frank LaRose in the past who fell out of line with him during this race and were disappointed in the type of campaign he ran. I think it's an open question what his political future is, at least in the immediate future. There's a governor's race in 2026, but we've already seen several Republicans line up to run for that. Um, Dave Yost, the Attorney General, John Houston, the Lieutenant Governor, um, the Treasurer, Robert Sprague may run. We're hearing that Vivek Ramaswamy <laughs> could throw his hat in the ring. So Ohio, when I forgot is, about that, yeah. He is an Ohioan. So LaRose mm -hmm. might be boxed out of that race. Uh, there's also been scuttlebutt about him maybe running for a congressional seat. Um, there's a pretty swingy seat uh, in his hometown of Copley, Ohio, where Amelia Sykes is the Democratic incumbent, mm -hmm. but she already has a Republican opponent this time. There was lots of talk that maybe LaRose should have dropped out of the Senate race and ran for that seat. He didn't do it. I think he'll be back. But I think it's going to take some, you know, some makeup work with the uh, with, with the Republicans who soured on. You mentioned that we don't know as much about Bernie Moreno as opposed to the other two candidates who have been in public office. Is part of the appeal for Democrats about him the fact that he is an unknown? There might be some something back there that they the people might not be aware of. Is there a chance of any of that happening? And are you hearing anything about that? I, I do think that that's part of the appeal. Like he's more of a blank slate. Um, he's not as known a he's not a, as known of a quantity as a Matt Dolan or a Frank LaRose were, um, and yeah, they, they, the 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 his his background in business is something that gives them a lot to work with. There were some reports that came out in the last few days of the Senate primary that um, were quickly batted down by the Marino campaign. You know, there are things like that that the Democrats are going to be looking at, I think, intently to see if they can make an issue out of. But I mean, it, it's it is what it is. I mean, be careful what you wish for. You know, right. we've seen in Ohio, like J.D. Vance, who did not have a very 
you know, he was he's not a public official. He was, he wrote a best-selling memoir. He was turned into a Netflix movie. Um, we saw President Trump, uh, Donald Trump, win Ohio twice, despite having no political experience. So right. Ohio does like outsiders. Um, and in a climate where Donald Trump is going to be on the ballot again as the Republican nominee for president, and Bernie Marino is going to be on the ballot as the Senate nominee, that is trouble for Sherrod Brown. I mean, any one of those three candidates could have theoretically beat Sherrod Brown. Bernie Moreno could obviously beat Sherrod Brown. But, you know, they got the, the Democrats have the contrast they want, but they also have, you know, a candidate who appeals to that Trump base because he's not a career politician. And Sherrod Brown, I'm not saying this pejoratively, Sherrod Brown is, is a career politician. He's been in politics for a really long time. Yep. And the Republicans will hammer him for that. Way to contrast. You're right. That's a very good point. Um, careful what you wish for. One last thing before we go, I have to address something that you also posted recently. This was um, something where you were celebrating the 26th anniversary of the album Feeling Strangely Fine by, uh, by Semi-Sonic. Uh, I'll show everybody. And wow, you've got the receipts. I just want to say, so you said so much more than, you're, you're praising the album Closing Time by the 90s band Semi-Sonic. You say so much more than, quote, Closing Time, one of the most underrated albums of the 90s. Also, if you haven't checked out the album they dropped last year, you should. You're still listening to Semi-Sonic at this point in life. I hope this doesn't undermine anything that I've said over the previous you know, five or 10 minutes. But, I'm you know, fascinated hey. that you hung on. I, I didn't even know that they were still doing stuff. Good for them. It's just, it's a, you understand that it is kind of a weird band to have latched onto and to still be listening to new music from. It's unique. Why them? I, 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 I like their music. Their, their, their front man, Dan Wilson, is a, very talented. He's actually produced a lot of, um, you know, popular music acts over the last few years. But okay. I don't know. They, if you if you followed Semisonic's history, they came out of the Minneapolis uh, Twin Cities music scene, which has birthed a lot of great uh, great bands like you know the Replacements and Hustle Do. And I mean, while they're not as like hardcore as those acts, they just I feel they're you know I I just musically found that superior layer to a lot of other things. So. I found that layer of you fascinating, and it just makes me all the more intrigued. A couple of other bands, though. I can tame multitudes. Um, have, you, have you been following any of these bands since the 90s? Marcy's Playground, Space Hog, Verve Pipe, Better Than Ezra, Seven Mary Three, or Not A Surf? Are you following any of them currently? Not A Surf still, not a surf still making music, as far as I know. But no, um, yeah. yeah like, those were all really popular when I assume you and I were both in high school. And, right. um, you know, but no, not, not as much as Semi-Song. All right. Well, if not a surf and semi sonic ever tour together, we're going. All right. I'm there. Right. Uh, thank See you. See you on the Gomez. line of Pre Appreciate your time, sir. And uh, stay sane out there. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye, buddy. I want to go to that show with not a surf and semi sonic, too. Here's the term I came up with for uh, huge fans of semi sonic semi soniacs. Oh. <laughs> I think that Henry Gomez is an official semi-Soniac and probably a pretty rare breed out there. No offense to semi-Sonic. I guess I've got to like reinvest in their catalog. See I what I'm missing. I love how much he knew about semi-Sonic. Also, I feel like we're saying it wrong because he very clearly said semi-Sonic. Oh, you're right. And I feel like he would know. Oh, I'm sorry, Henry. Seems like he would know. Henry, I'm with you. Also, his um, cat his <laughs> back went up like a cat when he heard that incorrectly pronounced. Um, I'm not mad at the verve pipe either. Sure, no. I mean, it's just weird that that's the one that he settled on. <laughs> of all of the, like, kind of one-hit wonder 90s bands, you just all of a sudden, it'd be like if you met somebody, like I said, who was really into Marcy's Playground. Uh -huh. You're like, I, I just follow him everywhere. <laughs> I can't help it. But, no, he uh, he's an interesting cat. You just, you never know what you're going to learn about Henry Gomez on this show. You never do. That's and what I always say. Listen, we love having Henry on the show. He's a fantastic guest. Henry, thank you so much. Yes, and I apologize. We were talking during that, and I apologize for my lighting and my backdrop. It was early, and I may, I did a bad job. Um, it looked pretty haunted. And there just, are no bad jobs. No, it was that was a pretty bad job. What would you recommend, though, everybody, <laughs> to have behind me instead of that? If you have a colored curtain that you'd prefer to have me put back there rather than those little house in the prairie ones I was just using, let us know. <laughs> I I think that we can come up with some good options. Mm -hmm. I feel like you can. You Ohio Ohio has issuance. What would we call our friends? I don't know. We'll come show. up with that. We'll come up with that. <laughs> oh, highs. Oh, I don't know. Just my mom and dad. Mm. Pretty much. Hi, Peggy and Senior. Who yeah. says that sometimes the interviews go on a little too long? That's what Peggy Polk said, especially the professors. She says they love their own voice. Just tell them to wrap. And it's your fault, she says. Says it's my fault, Peggy Polk does. She's like, tell them to wrap it up.
Well, sure, let's go ahead and yell hey, at those doctors from Case, Mom. It's, it's good advice. Keep it tight. Keep yeah. it tight. Um, one, one thing, though, that I do want to get to in the spirit of keeping it tight and moving along. Uh, Henry Gomez mentioned that Ohio has a pretty pivotal race in the Senate race. Yes. And could decide the balance of power in the Senate. So did a little story on that last week. So we're going to play that for you now. With Ohio's 2024 primary election behind us, we know Democrat incumbent Sherrod Brown and Republican business person Bernie Marino will be competing to try to win Ohio's U.S. Senate seat in the November general election. That brings us to the question. Could the winner of Ohio's Senate race determine the balance of power in the U.S. Senate? To verify the answer to this question, we checked the official websites for the United States government and the United States Senate, along with the nonprofit and nonpartisan online political encyclopedia, Ballotpedia, and the Cook Political Report, which is an independent nonpartisan political newsletter. First, we need to know that every two years, one third of the U.S. Senate's 100 seats are elected. These elections are staggered on purpose, according to USA.gov. This year, 33 states will hold regular and special elections for 34 U.S. Senate seats. Because of a resignation, Nebraska is in the rare situation where both of its U.S. Senate seats will be up for election in 2024. Checking the official U.S. Senate website shows that Democrats currently hold the majority in the Senate for the 118th Congress, with 48 Democrats, 49 Republicans, and three independents. As the Cook Political Report explains, the three independents caucus with the Democrats, giving Democrats a 51 to 49 seat majority. Of the 34 Senate seats up for election this year, only 11 of them are either currently held by Republicans or were held by them before resignations. And only two of those seats are not considered completely safe for Republicans to hold on to. On the other side of the aisle, 23 Senate seats up for election this year are either currently held by Democrats or independents or were held by them before resignations or death. As you can see here, 10 of these seats are not considered completely safe for Democrats to hold on to. One of those in West Virginia is all but guaranteed to flip from Democrat to Republican. And Ohio's Senate seat, which is currently held by Sherrod Brown, is listed as firmly in the toss-up column, which the Cook Political Report refers to as the, quote, most competitive, with either party having a good chance of winning. So we can verify the answer to the question, could the winner of Ohio Senate race determine the balance of power in the U.S. Senate is yes. Ohio's Senate race is considered one of the three most competitive Senate races in the country. And with the Democrats currently holding only a two person majority over Republicans in the Senate, the winner of Ohio Senate race could absolutely shift that power balance in either direction. See how important you are, Ohio? Remember, we used to be one of those states that decided the pre who the president was. Not so much anymore, but we can still mess with your Senate. <laughs> it is It is true. It's uh, really going to really kind of come down to it. Ohio is one of the three most competitive Senate races across the country. And John Tester and uh, Sherrod Brown are just like holding hands, like Thelma and Louise going up the cliff in their red states <laughs> saying, let's see what happens. <laughs> and we're going to see what happens. Yeah, we will. All the way to November. We'll be covering it for you folks. Stick yeah. around. And uh, So another conversation that we had this week as well was with a professor kind of talking about kind of like the primary recap and voter turnout specifically which is obviously very different in a primary election than it will be in the general election coming up in November especially in a presidential year. And this is not one of those boring professors that I told you <laughs> that my mom told you about earlier. This one is actually a very stimulated conversation. I've watched it and I think you're going to enjoy it. Yeah, this is Professor Atiba Ellis. He's with the Case Western Reserve University School of Law, a law professor there, and he's a scholar of the law of politics. He specializes in voting rights, inclusion and redistricting, and our conversation was about as I said primary voter turnout, how the polls actually got it wrong in terms of what we anticipated we might see in the primary election, campaign spending, and then a couple of those proposed constitutional amendments. So let's go to that interview now. Professor Ellis, thank you very much for being with us here on Ohio Has Issues. We're kind of doing our primary election sort of recap today, about a week after we did learn that the candidates who will be competing against each other for Ohio's U.S. Senate seat will be Republican Bernie Marino and then the incumbent Democrat Sherrod Brown. 
I want to go back to the primary race, though, just for a second with you and kind of touch on the fact that when we were leading up in the week to the primary election, there seemed to be this idea that maybe it was closer than we had previously thought the race might have been between Ohio State Senator Matt Dolan and the person who did end up winning, Bernie Marino. So I just wanted to get your perspective on maybe why the polling didn't indicate the actual wide margin that Marino ended up winning by. Sure. I think the ultimate challenge was that the polling seemed to show that at least um, a quarter of the electorate or thereabouts, given the margin of error, was undecided until the last minute. Um, certainly, the polls seemed to have Marino ahead by around 8% and sort of in the lead, but that large number of undecided voters seemed to make it uncertain for pollsters, and admittedly, I'm not a pollster, but the numbers as they seem to show leading up to the election left it so open that it would be unclear who would win. Now, of course, the reality of the politics was that Mr. Marino received Donald Trump's endorsement. And I think that in and of itself is a significant benefit to anyone in a Republican primary. And so that may well have played a substantial role in terms of the ultimate margin we saw. That is an excellent point that you make, of course. And then also there was the factor that the former president did end up coming here to Ohio too. Mm. I'm sure that had uh, an impact on things that maybe those polls didn't take into consideration as well. Yes, I think that's fair as well. When when the lead, when the presumptive leader of the party shows up to campaign for a candidate, that is a major shift. I mean, the reality of politics is that many voters don't pay attention until around the very last minute. And if that's the press that uh, undecided voter sees, that could very well help shift people's thoughts. Okay. What, do you, what are your thoughts on the turnout that we saw? for this particular primary election, people that actually did go out and vote in that primary? Well, I think that, again, this is in part, part of the challenge of primaries is that they're not the general election. They don't necessarily receive the same level of turnout that a primary might have. But um, what has been true about the Republican Party and especially the Trump-led Republican Party has been that and actually, let's take that back because I didn't realize that I didn't have Do Not Disturb on that oh, ding. Oh, okay. I don't know if you heard that ding, but... I, I didn't, but I do appreciate you make a note of that. And actually, I've got another computer over here beside me that I realized I didn't mute before we started. So I'm going to take this opportunity to do that as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> my, my high school best friend and I play... Um, connections in Wordle every day. So we're always comparing scores. And of course- Connections is hard sometimes. That, you know- <laughs> They become some really off the wall stuff. I am, I, it's been a week, but I'm angry about the fact that skeleton is an Olympic sport. And apparently the category was Olympic sports and like, come on. Um, the <laughs> I know they do really, they throw in a wild card. It's crazy. They do. They do. But we were talking about um, turnout. Right. Yeah. So I'll just ask you again, what, what's your thoughts on the voter turnout that we did see in the primary election? Well, certainly primary elections happening months from the general election are ordinarily lower than the general itself. And so this it tends to be a fact in elections, which means that they're largely driven by the voters who are highly motivated. And I think in this election in particular, consistent with the last several elections where we've seen the GOP led by then candidate, then president, and now former president Trump, those voters seemed motivated and it would appear at least from the data I understand that they clearly played a significant role and followed suit with the endorsement that he gave. 
that was kind of my next follow up question for you as you know, it, it is a small percentage of Republicans who did vote in this primary election registered here in Ohio. So do we have a clear picture on who it was that elected Bernie Marino to be the person to run in November? So, I mean, given the factor that the Trump endorsement played, I think this was a significant picture. It's Im This is impossible to tell without definitive data mining, but I think recent history also helps tell this story, right? Marino ran in 2022, but lost. He ultimately backed J.D. Vance. Um, and of course, it seems from reporting I've reviewed that Vance helped secure the Trump endorsement. So it seems like a fair amount of this is really about um, the motivation that the Trump wing of the Republican Party had to follow suit on where the former president pointed. Now, actually, I want to talk about comparing this primary election to the previous primary election, the one where J.D. Vance did secure that Republican nomination, went on to win an Ohio U.S. Senate seat. So spending in that primary election was actually more than this primary election that we just experienced, even though there was still a lot of money spent. And with this general election, Senate race projected to be one of the most expensive in the country. What are your thoughts on the spending that we've seen so far and what we will see going into the general? Well, I think that there is a huge investment given that I think the interests here would see that there's a lot at stake. Um, the, the read on Senator Brown is that um, his seat is vulnerable, that Ohio could be a pickup for the GOP. And given the razor thin margin in the US Senate, I think that a lot of the political interests are deeply invested in you know, pushing this election forward. So um, this targeting is consistent with the patterns that we've seen around the country and sort of seats that could push over the margin um, in as much as a lot of dark money interest seem to be pouring in money and want to have an influence in this race, right? And by dark money, I don't necessarily mean just Republicans, but Democrats as well, looking to spend. And of course, the political reality is that GOP spending will likely be exceptional this race, in large part because Sherrod Brown has the number one advantage in elections, incumbency. And the power of incumbency is a significant advantage. It's not impossible to beat an incumbent, but history has shown that incumbency makes the odds of re-election all the more greater. Senator Brown is quite popular in Ohio. Current polling shows him leading at least in a hypothetical race. But it's also fair to say that it's only the end of March right now and that there's a lot of time between March and November. Yes, there is. It is definitely going to be a long election season. We are going to see all kinds of things coming out in this Senate race. So uh, buckle up, everybody. We're just getting ready yeah. for it. <laughs> Um, I want to switch gears now, and I want to ask you about an amendment that could be on the ballot in November. It's been having a bit of a tough time. I wanted to get your thoughts on the voting and election-based amendment that could be on the November ballot. The access to voting and elections amendment, and some call it the Ohio Voters' Bill of Rights, um, basically it would institute same-day voter registration, expand early in-person voter registration, secure the ability for absentee voting, um, allow for student IDs and, and let them count as a voter ID and make other changes to sort of open up opportunities for voters to vote. Um, of course, Attorney General Yost has called the language um, misleading or untruthful might have been another word used. He has pushed back on it. And of course, the proponents of this bill have tried again to pass it. Um, it has yet to make 
the it has yet to pass that test and so at least as of right now it likely will it is not on the ballot yet um and so and in fact it is in the middle of proceedings in terms of that second effort to clear the attorney general's review um and that remains to be seen but obviously um ohio has been regarded by experts as having some of the strictest voting laws in the state of lengthy registration windows that have to be met before one can vote, um, a strict voter identification law and the like. So as a political matter, this is pushing back on what has been a long time uh, Republican talking point in terms of election integrity. Um, and so some of these procedural discussions might well be a proxy for um, the difference in the political point of view between the need to make more elections more secure and the need to provide broader access. Okay, so we'll see a little bit messy there. Still got to get some of that language certified. And then, of course, they've got to get all the signatures they need to have. And there's a deadline for that, which I believe is mid-July or something like that. So right. we'll see what happens there. We'll see what happens. Even if it passes the attorney general's review, you still have to get thousands of signatures to on the petition before early July, and they have to be gotten from at least half of Ohio's counties. So there are a number of hurdles for this to meet. There is another proposed amendment. This is dealing with the way districts are drawn here in the state of Ohio. What are your thoughts on that amendment? So this other amendment is designed to institute an independent redistricting commission so that the commission that will draw all of Ohio's election districts will not be in control of elected officials. I mean, Ohio has been through a lengthy process in terms of redesigning its um, redistricting program. And certainly right now we have a redistricting commission that is composed of the senior elected officials of the state who would then propose districts and offer them to the legislature. Um, but this bill is intended to take that power completely away from the elected officials and give it to an independent commission. That's further along in the process. It has passed the attorney general's review stage to make sure that the language is um, understandable and representative. And now it's in the process of gathering signatures. And as we suggested, we have to get somewhere over 400,000 signatures from half of Ohio's counties by July 3rd for it to make it to the November 5th ballot. Okay. And in your expertise, if I can ask your opinion, if you're willing to share it, as someone who has a specialty in election access and disenfranchisement. Do you have a thought on either of these two amendments? Is it too early to say? What do you think? Well, I think as a scholar, I am always supportive of efforts that make voting easier and more accessible. I think in this sense, efforts to lengthen the window of opportunity for people to vote to make as small as necessary, which in the computer age can be same day um, re registration, I tend to support those kinds of measures. And in fact, I'm happy to point out that this helps all voters regardless of partisan leaning. I think this is a notion that can bring more people into the political process and make it more representative. I think similarly, redistricting um, is a challenge because oftentimes, and history has pointed to Ohio among other states, both liberal leaning and conservative leaning, as heavily gerrymandered. Of course, these issues have been heard by the United States Supreme Court in the past, and, and the Supreme Court has sort of taken its hands off of these issues. So I support that the people are taking the initiative to redesign redistricting in Ohio so that every vote has a value. 
um, I think that I would suspect that because this is nonpartisan and because that this is fair to all Ohioans, that there likely will be substantial support for this redistricting amendment, which looks like it will hopefully make it onto the ballot in the fall. Um, but of course, on the other hand, this is a significant change to elected officials authority if it does pass. And certainly those same politicians who are concerned about election integrity may well be concerned that redistricting authority might be taken out of those hands. And it's ultimately a choice about where do we want this very important power to lie in Ohio? And at the end of the day, as it should be the case, the people ought to be the ultimate folks who decide this. Very well said. Couldn't have said it better myself. Love to see the people having a say in what's going on here in our great state of Ohio. Professor mm -hmm. Ellis, thank you so much for joining us here on Ohio Has Issues. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for your time. That was Professor Atiba Ellis sharing his insight and also his similar frustration at times with connections on the New York Times. And Wordle. Sometimes Wordle can be tricky, although yeah. I told you I did Wordle in three today. That's very good. I'm not telling anyone what it is because this is live and you might not have Wordled yet yes. and you still have a couple of hours to Wordle this Wordle before the new Wordle comes out. <laughs> there, there is still time. I hate when somebody spoils the Wordle. I know. Are people still doing that? String them up! Remember when Wordle first came out? We all do. Everybody, like someone would post it sometimes on what used to be Twitter and mm -hmm. is now X, and everybody would get mad. Yep. And because you know me, what I did was I waited for it to no longer become popular and then got on board. And now I'm one of the last, I think I'm one of the last wordlers. <laughs> you might be. Nobody, I will admit I only over. am familiar with connections because of you. Well, I, I do enrich lives everywhere mm -hmm. I go. That's I true. Do, yeah. He does. But that was a good conversation. Yeah, it really was. A lot of interesting insight from Professor Ellis. So thank you very much for being a part of the show. We appreciate it. Mm -hmm. All right. We do want to mention one article that came out from also friend of the show. Again, Mr. Tobias, what a terrible day for you to have a life outside of Ohio has issues. Darn it, Andrew. Um, no, it just, and this is important. He had an article last week talking about, you know what, uh, another election that is going to matter here, or another part of the election is going to matter, and that is that that redistricting amendment mm -hmm. to try and get rid of gerrymandering in Ohio. And this article was talking about how that is going to be one of the most expensive ad campaigns. People don't realize this yet, but we're gonna have national money pouring in for this uh, campaign. It's also going to be on the same ballot as um, the president presidential election, obviously, and the Senate election that we've been rambling to you about for the last couple of months. And why is that important? Well, here's why that's important, because if this gerrymandering or if this redistricting proposal were to pass, not in this upcoming election, but in elections moving forward, it's going to have a big effect on the House of Representatives mm -hmm. nationally because it's already, as you know, quite precarious. We're in a one seat majority, I believe, right now for the Republicans. And uh, it's, it's very tight. And right here in Ohio right now, we have a kind of out of whack um, situation because of gerrymandering. I think there are I should look, I, sh I actually have this. Let's be, I'm gonna be responsible. Cause look you guys deserve it. And we you do know, it. you know, we'll be using, for the first time I believe, we'll be using new maps for this 2024 election that will go into effect for the seats that are elected for 2025. So, you know, these are the ones that were put in place, but have been widely considered to be gerrymandered, even though this maps that we will be using for this election upcoming did pass by, under the current election redistricting commission. So prior to the mass being redrawn, Republicans had a 12 to 4 advantage with these, with this most, uh, the maps as they are drawn now, which uh, now it is Republicans hold 10 seats and Democrats hold five seats. Uh, but that is not representative necessarily of how we vote here in Ohio. So even if that ended up being just slightly less out of balance with the House of Representatives being as slim of a margin as it, as it is right now, even a three seat move could make a huge difference and give control to the other party. That's why uh, Andrew Tobias and, and other people are speculating that we're going to have a ton of national money on both sides probably mm -hmm. for and against this redistricting proposal, which will be on top of the money that will be coming in for the Senate campaign, which could decide this, uh, the balance of the Senate here in Ohio and the money from the national, cam from national campaign for
for the presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. And so you, if you think you are seeing some political ads now, Ohio, whoo hoo, buckle up. Ohio has issues and Ohio has political ads. Definitely. Yes. And another uh, aspect to this to consider as well is, you know, a lot of people considered Ohio in the previous election in November as kind of a test ground for the abortion access constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised if people were looking at the state of Ohio as kind of a test ground for this redistricting amendment because Ohio is not the only state with gerrymandered voting districts. Right. Very true. Yeah. And, uh, and also, we'll mention again that neither party is exclusively uh, doing this alone mm -hmm. because Democrats do it in states where they have the opportunity often as well. And uh, people are trying to say, or trying to finally say, hey, maybe we shouldn't be picking our own um, we're our own electors. We should be pick we shouldn't be picking our own people who are voting for us. They should be picking us, and that's what everybody's trying to do right now here in Ohio, at least with that amendment. And I gotta tell you, I think it's probably time. I think it's absolutely time to make sure that our voting districts are representative of yeah. the people voting. In we Ohio. tried it once; it didn't stick. Uh, they didn't they didn't like it enough. It, so we've got to make that language a little more specific. And I think that that's uh, what we're, we're attempting to do here in Ohio, and it'd be good to see that balance. I also think it's time to recognize the fact that that mug is adorable, that you're Thank enjoying you. your copy out of. I appreciate it. It was just in the kitchenette area. It probably belongs to someone. It was probably a gift from somebody's grandchild. And I didn't even clean it. I just, I'm just drinking oh, it. Oh, well, we're all a big family here. Yeah. So, cheers to that. All right, I think that was an excellent episode. I think so, too. Should we ask you to decide? We'll just go ahead and leave it there. Yeah. All right. Thanks for joining us on Ohio Has Issues. Well, we'll see you back next week uh, again on Wednesday, live at 730 afterwards on the podcast platforms and all that jazz. Thanks to producer Beebs on the ones and twos. Appreciate you. Appreciate Thanks for you. watching, everybody. See you next week. Bye.